Thank you. So uh, on Sunday, I was uh, preparing uh, the exercise sheet. It was like 10 p.m. <laughs> and uh, I had to put labels as easy, medium, or hard. So I fell for that trick. I shouldn't have. So everything was hard. <laughs> really think about it. Like uh, uh, the first time you meet some mathematical topic, it's hard. It's, there is no, no way around, right? Uh, so, um, so I wanted to start this lecture by discussing a little bit the exercise uh, that I saw you uh, uh, yesterday, uh, very fast, uh, so just to show uh, the rule was Oh, don't write any uh, formal proof, and I will not write any formal proof, but I will just tell uh, to the good people that you are who worked hard uh, on, uh, on some exercises, I just tell my, my, my spin on it. But um, okay, uh, probably you all looked at the first one. Uh, I don't know if you have the exercise sheet with you. Um, uh, I'm, reading out, I'm reading it out uh, loud. Uh, show that uh, SL2R acts transitively on the set of unordered triples of R union infinity. So, I should say, yeah. Let me, oh, something disappeared. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's let's uh, let's see, let's see uh, let's see that. So we have we have a, uh, a few matrices that uh, we prefer here. We have um, those ones. Those ones. Well, this one, I suppose, uh, and uh, this one. And one should do using only that, actually, because uh, anyway, that's uh, enough to, uh, to have uh, everything that, uh, uh, that is interesting. So I draw the picture. I take A, B, C, and I wanted to put them, I want to put them to minus one, one, infinity. So I first use this one, which is just translation, so that b is now at 0. Or c is now at 0, anyway. So then I use this one, which takes 0 to infinity. Oh, I'm happy now. So using this one and this one in order, I'm taking uh, some of those three points to infinity. Now using this one again, which is fixing infinity, I'm taking the two others so that they are centered at zero. And now using this one, which is a dilatation, I'm just pushing them apart until I reach minus one, one. So this shows that uh, I can reach from any triple, I can reach minus one, one infinity. Good. And um, <coughs> after that, there was a question about how the ideal triangle minus one, one infinity was uh, delta thin in the sense that uh, uh, any side was in the sum delta neighborhood of the two other side. And I know that some people are really attached to find the optimal value of delta. And I should say I don't care the optimal value of delta here. Uh, so for someone like me who doesn't want to do any computation and who doesn't care about the optimal value of delta, uh, I cut the triangle in three parts above some parts uh, here, where it's easy to, it is easy to see using the explicit metric, which is divided by the height, you know, that distance from there to there is small. But now, I can, in, I can 
just say that uh, uh, this point is in the orbit of that point, so there is a cutoff here from which the sides are close to each other, and same here because of the group action. So I'm left with something here when I need to check whether those three sides are at bounded distance from each other. This is a compact situation. Of course, they are at bounded distance from each other. So there is some delta. And if you like, you can compute the optimal delta, which is something like, I don't remember, log of 2, uh, log of 3, something like that. And now if I want to do that for all triangles, well, I take an arbitrary triangle. OK, can I draw that? Well, as I, as I say, um, I can certainly put this side by isometry on the vertical here. Um, so now what is the picture of it? I have an arbitrary triangle whose one side is vertical here, and the two other sides are something like, I don't know. Uh, really, I don't know. OK. So they are, uh, the, the whole triangle fits in this one. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. I think it is. Uh, this one we know is uh, delta thin, so uh, there is no room inside. So the, the whole triangle has to be uh, thin. Okay. Uh, what was uh, next? Uh, Zn is quasi-isometric to Rn, or an explicit quasi-isometry. Then uh, the integral part of... Uh, oh, sorry? That version was distributed towards the... Yeah, there are two versions of it. <laughs> uh, Rn uh, Qi to Zn which is a stronger version of the exercise. So show, show the quasi-isometry for Rn to Zn. Well, if I take a tuple, I can certainly look at the integral parts of each of them and, uh, and see where it goes. And OK. Let's now check that uh, it's uh, good. Well, I suppose it was. Uh, so show that I'm, I'm, I'm skipping. I'm uh, just uh, strolling through the exercises, and it's not official formal solutions as you, as you understand. Show that two kilograms of above finite generating set are quasi isometric. Um, well, uh, so there is a, a word metric associated to S1, a word metric associated to S2, and a good idea is to check what is the maximal value of the word metric of S1 for elements of S2. So, uh, look at max for S in S2 of the word metric ds1 from 1 to S. That's one way to control it. And the other way is replacing <coughs> the two roles. And that tells you how to send one edge here, what is the length of the path there. And then when you, when you know what is the maximal factor, you're basically done uh, from one way to the other and from the other way to the one. <laughs> That's not English, but uh, write a proof of Schwartz, sorry, Schwartz-Milnor lemma. Uh, when you have time. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, let G be a finitely generated group so that if H is finite index subgroup of G, then it is quasi isometric to G. Well, that's already exercise four. So H finite index in G 
Well, H acts on the k-graph of G by isometries, left translation, uh, properly discontinuity, uh, it's, it's just a subgroup, so freely actually, uh, and uh, with um, finitely many orbits, so co-compactly. So we know that uh, it means that uh, uh, H is finitely generated and quasi-isometric to the space on which it acts. Uh, deduce that all finitely generated non-abelian free groups are quasi-isometric to each other. Wow. So uh, a free group of rank K is a fundamental group of the rows with uh, K petals, meaning the graph with one vertex and K edges. So, um, what do you want to say? Uh, the free group of rank, uh, okay, free group of rank 2 is a fundamental group of uh, this simple thing. And now if I want to find finite index subgroups, that means I want to find finite covers of this topological space. But there are, there are easy finite covers uh, that, uh, I mean, I should ban the word easy from my vocabulary from now on, <laughs> because what is hard two minutes ago is now easy once you understand it. And I should have used colors to show the covering this is sent to that as a n-fold cover, and uh, this is sent to that each time. OK. Now, this is um, a rank uh, whatever uh, free uh, group, which corresponds to a finite cover of, uh, rank two, uh, of uh, the rows of two petals. So it's finite index subgroup of F2. So uh, if you never saw that, it means that all free groups, uh, non-abelian free groups, can be seen as finite index subgroups of the rank free group of rank 2, though they are all quasi-isometric to each other. On the contrary, it shows that z square is not quasi-isometric to z cube. And uh, uh, I think that the right way to see that is uh, to uh, know in advance that uh, the growth function is a quasi-isometry invariant <laughs> and uh, check that they do not have the same growth function. The growth functions say uh, how fast that the ball of radius r in the Kelly graph of this group grow. So in, one's, in one situation it's quadratic, in the other it's cubic. And uh, this property is preserved by quasi-isometry. So they are not quasi-isometric. Do, do you know an elementary group? Other than this one, no. I don't know. Well, and I don't, maybe I know other proofs, but not element. <coughs> Doesn't mean that the noise is known. Okay. Okay, that's it for the. Uh, uh, if you allow me, that's it for the uh, sketch of the exercise. Uh, uh, Okay, so let me resume then what I was saying last time. Okay, maybe I should just erase everything here. So last time I was speaking, yesterday, I was speaking about uh, 
uh, hyperbolic groups. And relatively hyperbolic groups. And with two definitions of relatively hyperbolic groups, one using hyperbolic fine graphs, so angularly locally finite graphs, and the other one using proper, so yeah, proper, I say again, that means Closed balls are compact. <coughs> By opposition to this one, which is not locally finite as a graph, usually. Proper hyperbolic space <coughs> with invariant system of horribles. And uh, I found that, um, OK, I didn't check, but I, I think so. Is that the picture in the poster? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and, oh, yeah, on the, on we the all have it on our badge. A picture of a hyperbolic space with an invariant system of horribles. So I'm very uh, flattered to. <laughs> so. I struggled with the technical definition of horrible uh, yesterday, you remember? That, that was virtually impossible to apprehend in, uh, in two minutes. Um, that's really hidden here is a point at infinity. Some ray that I don't even want to draw it, but OK, let me draw a ray pointing directly at that point. And on the way, on the ray, I take larger and larger balls. etc. Take the union, and that's a horo ball, ball at horizon, I suppose. <laughs> OK, so. Much better way to explain what it is. Uh, so I erase construction uh, 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 drawing. But so uh, this means that our, 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 uh, our ugly subgroup in, the, in, in G, so we have a group G and P, a subgroup that is the reason for non hyperbolicity, usually, that our ugly sub, I mean, ugly. Uh, uh, Non-hyperbolic uh, subgroup uh, or parabolic subgroup will fix uh, one point at infinity, and its conjugate fix uh, another point at infinity. So this will be fixed by p, and this one will be fixed by well a conjugate of p, g, p, g inverse. And um, what the so the what's the morality of this situation? In both cases, it says the same thing, but in different languages. I want to say what it says. Uh, here we see that the conjugates of p fix convexes, convex sets in my hyperbolic space that. Uh, maybe sometimes are close to each other, but for, uh, not for very long. If I travel inside my convex set, I must dive through the point at infinity, and here <laughs> through another point at infinity, so very far away from uh, uh, a part. So the, the thing fixed by p and the conjugate of p have virtually nothing to do with each other. Like in a free product. In a free product A star blah blah, the conjugates of A have nothing to do with A. And so I, I was saying, this is 
visible in the picture. I try to make it visible. This is also visible with the finest condition that says that uh, when I have a cone point over a coset, and I choose a way, I choose an edge E, well, I can only come back to uh, this coset uh, in bounded time in a finite, uh, finitely many ways, serious ways. Uh, of course, I could uh, do uh, uh, crazy things. Come back without saying it, go somewhere else, come back. But that's not what I want. If I want uh, just a simple loop, only finitely many possibilities. That's the definition of fineness. Only finite mean finitely many other edges with given angle. So let's have an example that I discussed with uh, some of you yesterday uh, of a cone of graph that is not fine. And that's very easy, that uh, counter example. Uh, Z square, or Z plus Z, in which the second factor will be P. So here is the first factor, here is the second factor, and of course, well, you all know Z plus Z. And what do I have to do? I have to cone off the coset of the second factor, so the vertical lines. Coning off the vertical lines means that I have uh, just the horizontal lines remaining. Um, well, infinitely many. And slices here that are all coned off by some special vertex. And since they are infinitely many, you see that cycles of length 6 from here going down to the horizontal, going right, Going up, I have infinitely many uh, paths of length 3 that come back. So it's not fine. It's not fine because cosets remain parallel to each other. Because conjugates intersect. This, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, ultimately the reason. So it's not fine and there is no hope to have conjugates well separated like that. Okay. So let me move on now. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, a theorem uh, in, uh, about relatively hyperbolic groups uh, that tells you somehow that you're never that far from hyperbolic groups when you are in a relatively hyperbolic group. That's the um, Den Filling Theorem. Um, so, a, a little bit of uh, historical comments here. Uh, so, what is, uh, what is then filling or then surgery? To begin with, it has to do, th it has to do with three manifolds. And uh, 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 so if you have a three manifold where the boundary uh, is a torus, so for example, think about a knot complement, but you, instead of removing just the knot, you remove the small neighborhood of a knot. That was Dan's motivation. So, uh, uh, hyper uh, sorry, uh, three manifold whose uh, boundary is uh, a torus that you would like, you can be tempted to fill in the torus by a solid torus. Solid torus is just the disk times circle. So I don't know how to draw it. <laughs> Maybe suggesting that this is full. I don't know. So the solid torus has a torus as boundary. Your manifold M has a torus as boundary. 
Maybe you want to glue the torus on the torus to fill the hole. And then you realize, oh, there are many ways to do it. Uh, you have to choose how you glue some framing to some framing here. And if you think a little bit uh, about it, what is important is the slope of the meridian in the framing of your torus. That's a homotopy equivalent invariant. Uh, so, um, so uh, yeah, that's a dense feeling. Choose a slope. Uh, in in T, glue the meridian. Uh, so solid T, glue the solid T such that the meridian goes on the slope. And uh, much later, uh, Thurston, who was interested in uh, hyperbolic manifolds, but well, this is just topological, right? If a Thurston was interested in hyperbolic manifolds, among other things, I suppose, uh, proved the following, that there are only finitely many slopes that <coughs> give you something weird. Other than that, all other slopes will give you a compact uh, hyperbolic manifold. I, I, did, I, did I say an assumption here? No. So there is missing assumption. So <laughs> I say that again. So if you start with M uh, complete uh, hyperbolic manifold, uh, well, yeah, finite volume hyperbolic manifold. with one cusp, of dimension 3, for all but finitely many slopes, the result of what you glue, so is a compact 3-manifold, this is just topological, but not any compact 3-manifold, it's a hyperbolic compact 3-manifold. Ah, is the statement clear? Because I had to uh, say it twice the first time uh, this part was missing. Is the statement clear? So you start with a hyperbolic knot complement. You remove a little bit more than just the, uh, the, the knot itself to get uh, a full circle, a uh, full uh, torus. You glue a solid torus along a complicated slope, and then you get a hyperbolic manifold again. Um, well, there is a statement in uh, group theory say, saying saying this uh, in the in the in the realm of uh, relatively hyperbolic groups. So. Uh, so the theorem, which is due to uh, Osin, uh, there is another version by Groves and Manning, um, is the following, is an adaptation of this uh, setting. So if G is hyperbolic, is there, is there a question? There is a missing word. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, M union ST glued on the slope. So I should have uh, said choose a slope and let me write it like that. This means uh, 
st glued on m such that little m goes on the slope s. If G is hyperbolic relatively to P, there exists a finite set uh, F, I call it, uh, inside P minus the identity uh, such that Uh, for all normal subgroup of P, avoiding F, the group G quotiented by the normal closure of N in G, Uh, contains the faithful image of P mod N N is hyperbolic relatively to Uh, P mod N. Okay, is it really the same? So G will be for the fundamental group of M, hyperbolic relatively to Z square. There is a finite, the finite set in uh, Z square minus the identity, such that whenever I take, so here, whenever I take a cyclic subgroup of Z square, Killing the slope, killing a slope not in F, then the group, the quotient, is hyperbolic, hyperbolic relative to Z square mod some cyclic group here. Well, that has to be uh, virtually cyclic, well, actually, uh, to get a manifold. Uh, so Hyperbolic relatively to Z means hyperbolic. So it tells the result of Thurston at the level of fundamental groups. Of course, to, to have a, a true uh, hyperbolic structure on the manifold, it's another story. <laughs> But at the level of fundamental groups, it gives uh, uh, the theorem, uh, the Den Filling theorem. So it says also. Uh, that assume, for instance, that P is residually finite and choose N to be finite index normal subgroup. So, blah, 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 relatively to P mod N, relatively to a finite group. So it says that G mod N will be hyperbolic. So if G is, re again, if G is residually, too many long words. If G is residually finite, and if N is a uh, uh, deep enough uh, finite index subgroup, then the result is hyperbolic. So I'd like to see it as uh, we, are nowhere ne we are nowhere far from uh, hyperbolic groups in this uh, setting. Um, So, uh, you said the hyperbolic relationship is a Jimian hyperbolic. Yeah, there is, um, yeah. So, there is fact uh, that I used twice in two sentences, so it's fair that I <laughs> just. Uh, if uh, G is uh, hyperbolic relatively to uh, P, and P is hyperbolic, 
then G is hyperbolic. I believe the first time uh, this fact is due to Osin. In this level of generality. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'd like to um, sketch a proof of uh, the Den Filling theorem. Um, Of, uh, of the theorem. And it's using um, uh, so-called uh, rotating families. But I, 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 will, I will say what is, um, uh, what's going on. So take x uh, to be uh, one of two favorite spaces for G. And I will take the model with horribles. How do you say? Uh, uh, OK. So proper hyperbolic space. So the model with invariant horribles. for G relative to P, OK? So this is this picture. Maybe I do it again. OK. All those horribles are in one single orbit. Uh, of the one preserved by P. And um, for some, uh, okay, I will deal with quantifier later. I will try to say what, what I want to do and see what's going with quantifier and the order later. I will choose a, a system, a much deeper system of horribles. So we'll see how much deeper, what much deeper means. Well, they are still convex. Uh, they are still uh, preserved by the conjugates uh, of P. It's just they are much far away from each other, much farther away from each other. And uh, I will cone them off. I will remove uh, them and replace them by uh, a coning off. So here I have a new vertex, and now it's coning here. The advantage of doing that is uh, about um, angles. So when you are at point at infinity, P acts on the orosphere. Uh, by turning the orosphere, but it fixes the point. And so it fixes all the, well, it permutes all the geodesics that go to this point. So it indeed does some kind of rotation, rotation on the orosphere. But if there is any angle on it, it's zero, always zero. Because any uh, rotation deep enough, close enough to the point at infinity will, will do almost nothing. All your, uh, if you think about it in the upper half plane, uh, the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 million, 0, 1, 
it's just translating a lot on the Eurosphere, but if you are ready to move up, it's translating almost nothing. So angle of rotation would be zero in the yellow horoboles. But in the blue, just con conned off, well, it's something. It's non-zero. of some angle. And now, if I have sufficient residually finiteness, or if I, if I am uh, free to choose n uh, as deep as I want, I can choose n so that for this rotation, it turns with large angles. Uh, what's VP again? Oh, yes. VP will be this one. The new vertex that used to cone off the orosphere uh, fixed by P. And what do you mean by rotation in a general hyperbolic? <laughs> so first, it's an elliptic uh, uh, element, okay? But now I have also uh, I have also this concept of angles that I, I defined uh, previously. That the angle between two edges would be the length of the smallest path going to their endpoints without going through the apex. So this elliptic element, I can say that, uh, okay, it's a little bit abusive probably to say it's a rotation, I don't know, but uh, I'll finish this sentence to make it, uh, to, 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 to give some sense to that, that it fixes VP and it sends every edge to another edge that has a large angle with it. And I don't know how to call a, a transformation that fixes a point and make a large angle between edges, but rotation, I don't know. So the, is it fair? <laughs> so that uh, any element, any non-trivial element, Uh, sends uh, any edge adjacent to uh, VP to an edge making a large angle. Okay. Picture. Zooming in to this VP, which is way too small here. This is coning off the horosphere uh, somewhere here. And I allow only elements in N that turn a lot uh, along this horosphere. Okay, and the main claim. Sorry, so the edges connect VP to the geodesics uh, with endpoint P. Is that right? What are the edges here? So the edges will be yeah. They connect this new vector this new vertex VP to an orbit, a P orbit, uh, in the yellow orosphere. It doesn't have a name. I should, should say it's uh, yellow HP. Is the horosphere or the horosphere? The horosphere. Because if I was to cone off the whole horoball, maybe that's what is written. Cone them off. So only horosphere. Thank you.
if I was to con off the entire horrible, I, I, for every n, I would find some edge with small angle. The same problem that the original horrible. But the horrible is not fixed by, by p, is it? You look at the geodesics, which... which uh, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> The horrible is morally the boundary of the the, uh, the borosphere is morally the boundary of the horrible. The horrible is fixed by p, so the horosphere is preserved by p either. So this is the spiral that's fixed by n. It's preserved by p. Okay. Once again, the yellow uh, horrible is preserved by p. The yellow orosphere is preserved by P as well, as boundary of something preserved by P. Uh, and uh, being preserved by P, it's preserved by N. Uh, and, uh, and I take a P orbit in it, and I cone off the P orbit. So this is... How about it fixed? Does it mean that P is not a parabolic edge? Yes, uh, well... Okay, formally, no. I, we'd like to think it is made of parabolic elements. There could be some elliptic elements in P as well. There could be some elliptic elements in P as well. But they fix the point at infinity. So, yeah. Imagine there is a finite normal subgroup fixing everything in the picture. Its elements are uh, elliptic because they fix points inside the space. But they belong to the group P, but as individual isometries, they are not parabolic, they are elliptic. Sorry. Yeah? Wh where can you choose such an? Okay. <laughs> Uh, in general, you cannot. In general, you cannot. If your group is relatively finite, then, then, then you can. The action of P on the orosphere is, uh, is proper because uh, uh, in the complement of the, of the horrible, the action of G is properly discontinuous. Uh, so, uh, so if you are allowed to say, okay, there exist finite index subgroups uh, as, depth, as deep as I want, then you may say, uh, I choose a finite index subgroup so that there is no small element in this proper action. But in general, you cannot do that. In general, you don't know if there is any uh, finite index subgroup. Yes? Did we assume that P uh, contains no box hydraulic elements? How do we know it's only hyperbolic? I mean, hyperbolic elliptic. So P is assumed to fix the point uh, uh, at infinity of the robot. And indeed, uh, uh, it will not have a luxodromic element. Okay. Yeah, so what uh, I'd like to uh, uh, recover where I was together with you. Um, ah, yes, I was here. So we choose N. Oh, I understand why it was a question. Are we allowed to choose n? We take n, if possible, uh, such that uh, any non-trivial... Uh, okay. Well, now, so choose, if possible. <laughs> and um, now the main claim That makes everything uh, work, and I explain quickly why. Um, that now, if I do, if I look at the quotient of the space, not of the group, but of the space, uh, oh, I need a name for this uh, space. So let's call x dot the uh, cone of space. So the final space, the cone of. So x minus yellow horribles. Union the cone of. Uh, 
I hope this is clear. This is sketchy. So th this is the result of all the construction. I take X, I remove the yellow horribles, I cone off the orospheres. So the main claim is that the quotient of this space by uh, the transformation induced by conjugates of n uh, is a local isometry. away from where it is not, and where it is not, is uh, on the vertices. So of course the rotation, it's not a local isometry at the vertices because it's folding something on the vertices. It's turning uh, uh, these two edges into a single one because they are in the same orbit. But everywhere else, it is a local isometry. And um, let me just sketch why. But uh, this requires an argument. It's just an illustration of what's happening. And I, I have no time to, to develop the entire argument because I want to also make the conclusion. Uh, but when you take a convex and you make a rotation of very large angle around uh, one point, then you have uh, the image of the convex is another convex. And I claim that they are disjoint. They are disjoint because uh, what if they were not disjoint? Uh, that means that I have uh, this element and this uh, element joined by this rotation. So here I have a path between them that avoids the cone point, but this is in the image of this one. Okay, so this element is realized by an element in N. So let me see what it does here it does some rotation with a path that does not go through there. So it has to bound the angle. The angle is bounded by the length of this path. And we're working a little bit more. We realize that the angle cannot be as large as we wanted it to be. And finally, uh, what to do with that? It's a local isometry away from the vertices VP. And there is a um, general uh, local to global principle in all the hyperbolic geometry uh, around it. It says, it says the following. So the quotient space locally will look like x dot. So it will locally be hyperbolic. Gromov hyperbolic. Sorry, sorry, but every space is locally Gromov hyperbolic. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yeah, okay. I said I, I will do it with quantifier uh, later uh, to, to say how the quantifier comes into the picture. But, uh, I, and, and uh, maybe I will not have time to do that. But I will try to, 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 to go through that. Uh, stick with me for like one minute and then I, I come back to that. So it's locally uh, Gromov hyperbolic. Moreover, it's, um, it comes from a space that could, uh, uh, was, uh, um, uh, can be thought as simply connected, or uh, throwing in the right cells could have been simply connected to begin with. And so uh, you quotient it by elliptic elements, so you keep this property. So it's still coarsely. So at large scale, uh, simply connected. And there you have uh, 
euh, difficulty OM, euh, carton à Damar, euh, but for Gromov hyperbolic spaces, so, euh, carton à Damar Gromov theorem. That tells you that with good, with good quantifiers, this uh, implies uh, that uh, it is uh, uh, indeed globally hyperbolic. So here I state with good quantifiers. So if a space is simply connected, let me state it like that. It's easier. And uh, 10 to the 7 delta locally delta hyperbolic, then it is del uh, 300 delta hyperbolic. And if you ask me, those constants uh, are not so uh, interesting, except that they are uh, uh, explicit, I mean, constructive. Uh, but I would have been happy with there exists L such that blah blah. Now, now I can go back and see what's going on in the argument. I want this to hold for spaces of size 10 to the 7 delta. So I want the apices to be at least that apart. So now I can say what it means to take deep yellow horribles. So that apices are much, much more uh, apart than this constant. Now I can say what it means for H to have large rotation, because I could not say it before knowing what were the yellow horribles. And so the, 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 the N having a large rotation means on these faraway horribles having rotation that assure that this argument will, uh, will hold, that rotating uh, this amount will put convex subset uh, on disjoint convex subset. Um, and now, and now I can say what is F in the theorem. F will be all the elements that I need to avoid to be sure that N does that. So it was, it was a bit fast. I, I don't know if it uh, uh, cleared your question. But of course, I'm not claiming that uh, I'm using this theorem for space that are like uh, one locally hyperbolic. It's, uh, we, we moved the, 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 the rotation points far apart in order to have sufficiently room to have this local hyperbolicity. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there.